it was very cool, I thought. Um, the lesson that we watched from Mounts last week um, about the chapter in his book because it had a lot of stuff that I actually wanted to talk about. And so I just want to recap some of it um, so that the references in um, this video for people who, you know, online you can't see the other videos because I didn't record them. Um, so we were watching a discussion video from Bill Mounts uh, concerning his book, uh, Why I Trust the Bible. And uh, that's just kind of the context of this. When, uh, when I was in college, monochronic, and some people are called polychronic. Now, these are two big words. <laughs> you might say, now what the heck does that mean? Well, it's like this. Some places in the world, they meet at 12, right? We're going to meet at 12, whatever. That means 12. America is one of those places. It's monochronic. One time. This is the time that I expect you to be here. And some places think that that means you show up early. You know, like uh, maybe your father always taught you, hey, when you go to this place, if somebody expects you there at 7, you're there at 6.50 or something. You know, there's, there's always those people too. But other places see it more as a general guideline that isn't really precise. So if you say, hey, we're going to start this Bible study at 12, those show up anywhere between... 11 to 3, just anywhere in that general, because they're polychronic. It's not really specific to the general time. And in his video last week, Mounts mentioned um, that they had a different way of recording things back then and when the Gospels were written that allowed for more flexibility to summarize an event or to paraphrase what happened instead of being overly literal. And uh, to he even said that it, it was normal practice back then to take two separate events and blend them into one. And I thought that that was very interesting he should bring that up because it made me think of that lesson that I took back in college about different people groups and how they understand things differently. And so would you say in one of those other countries, if they said, hey, I'll meet you at 12 and they didn't get there till 3, would you call them a liar? Well, no, of course not. That's how they do things there. And it just really, um, I think it really offered a lot of uh, insight into what I've been trying to explain throughout the past, well, seven previous lessons to this, talking about the way that, you know, different authors mention the same thing slightly differently. It's it's not that one's lying and one's telling the truth. It's just that there's, that's just how, how they wrote. And uh, his discussion last week, I think, really just put the put the ribbon on it, you know, put the, the candle on the cake. Um, these, these things that the Gospels writers wrote, even when they took two different events and blended them into one, they weren't seen as contradictions either to the writer or, more importantly, to the audience. That, I think, is of supreme importance that they, when they did this, the people who were listening or reading, more likely listening, uh, to what the writers had to say, everybody understood, hey, we don't do things hyper-literal here. That's just the way it was. Go to another country, and then when they say, hey, we're going to meet at 12, watch how frustrated you get as the hours go by and nobody shows up, and then all of a sudden, you know, they're meeting at 3 or something like that, and you're thinking, well, this is not 12 o'clock. See what I mean? Watch how frustrated you get. Why? Because this isn't the way we do things here. It's like we're not here anymore. We're there. <laughs> this is the way they do things there. And that's very true when we're looking at the Gospels. We can get mad all we want about, well, that, that's not how you do things. That's No, no, that's not how you do things. <laughs> There's a big difference. If the Gospels were written nowadays, well, they probably would have followed modern standards. And we talked about the way that um, there was something that was said in the, in the lesson last, last week that I, I wish I could remember exactly what was said. It was something about that where you can't expect them to do it. Your oh, oh, I remember. Um, looking at a thing and saying we are at the climax of how things are supposed to be written. And so they should have uh, followed our standards today 2,000 years ago. And everywhere else in the world that doesn't do it like us, they're all wrong. And we will never go anywhere further than this. It's like, no, <laughs> that's, just, that's just so arrogant and wrong and historically inaccurate. But anyways... So these things were not seen as a contradiction. And he mentioned uh, the story of the fig tree. So was the fig tree killed immediately or not? Because one gospel says that when Jesus cursed it, the fig tree died then and there. And another one said that when they were coming back the next day, it was dead. Well, which one was it? Well, there's a few things. First off, under the guidelines that Mount showed us, it could act, it 
it wasn't written as precise, so it actually could technically be more of a more of both. You know, yeah, okay, so he, he wrote it, and then, you know, they, they noticed it the next day, or they, they really saw that it was, that was like, okay, whatever, but it died right then. So another, uh, you could say it more, more maybe as a scientific way of trying to blend the two accounts together is saying something like this. Well, it died then, but you didn't see the effects of the death until the next day. Mm -hmm. you, you could say that. That's more of a scientific thing. But the gospel writer isn't interested in the scientific definition of what happened. He knew that when Jesus said it, it died right then. That was, he didn't feel like he was lying about anything or, or that he wasn't, con he, he was contradicting another gospel. So, well, and uh, let's see. We so said we think, see things differently. We require a higher precision. So we see these events as misleading, and that's one of the biggest things is you will always see things according to the bias of where you live. And that's just something that can't be avoided. Um, and the important part isn't that you go to something without bias. It's that you're aware of your bias and you analyze whether or not it's affecting the truthfulness of the outcome. Um, I think it was Gracie last week was telling the story about a, um, a female-dominated society. I don't remember exactly where it was, but I don't think it's really that relevant. And um, so they, they changed the message of the Bible so that the people would understand the core of what the Bible was saying. Instead of God being a he, he was a she. Not that it's that important anyways, because remember, God doesn't have genitals. He's, he's not a man as we think of a man. So, you know, what, it was more of a way of showing his authority, especially given the context, which we don't have time to go into. But, you know, that would be a good example of contextualizing. Were they lying about God? No. No, they weren't. So you can make anything sound good or bad when you're talking about the Gospels. And that's something I want you guys to be very aware of whenever you're reading a book or anything like that. You can make the exact same thing sound very good or very, very bad. It's like we don't even know what was written because they just changed so much. I mean, how can you possibly trust a book that, you know, they, they all disagree. All the four Gospels disagree on how something happened. They all disagree on how Jesus said something. I mean, you can demonize anything and make anything sound bad. Well, they were they were imprecise and filled with little mistakes. I mean, t take what I just said about um, about the go about the gospels, ha where you could take two events and put them together and be historically accurate. Okay. Well, they just took different events and they forgot so much and they just blended them all together and just some confused blur of what actually happened. The exact same thing I just said, but just said in a negative way. A lot of the things you're going to run into um, in you know, people talking about the Bible and why you shouldn't trust it is, is that. You, you take a core of something that's true and you just kind of lean it to whatever what you're trying to say. It's, it's called a straw man. There's called – actually, depending on how you shade it, there's a lot of different logical fallacies that could fall under. Um, well, they couldn't even quote the Old Testament right. Don't be fooled by people's rhetoric, how pretty they talk. So just, let's see, one more thing. At the time, it wasn't even wrong to make two events when I said that. It was considered factual, trustworthy, reliable. Now we only see hyperliteral. Okay, I already mentioned that. Because we think that way, it is the only way to think. I already mentioned that. Okay, good. So now we can go ahead with Matthew, starting in chapter 16. And I cannot believe that we are already in Matthew 16. And after tonight, we will be after, we will be past Matthew 20. So, yeesh, moving along. We'll start with Matthew 6. Um, yeah, Matthew 16, verse 16. And this is what it says. Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Well, if you compare this with the other two, and, and I'll just read one of the other ones. We'll go to Mark 8, 29. And he said, I'm sorry, this is the 8, 29. There we go. Uh, and he continued questioning them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said to him, you are the Christ. Well, say we only have a partial quote there. And then Luke 9, 20. Well, I won't going to read it, but they, you are, he, he says something like, you are Christ most high or something like that. And it's like, well, there's a few things. First off, 
Remember that they are translating from Aramaic into Greek. And then remember that they wrote to paraphrase to get the idea of what was being said, not exact and literal. They maintained the truth, but they still paraphrased. And then also don't forget that they said things differently to support the different point that they were making. Like, so for instance, um, Matthew was written more to a Jewish audience. So he's going to include the little things in there that are going to mean more to Jews. And then, you know, Mark is more written possibly to Romans. Possibly it's kind of iffy there. Uh, Luke was more written to, obviously, uh, Gentiles, Theophilus. Um, and so they all have their own little, their own little who they was written to and what their main point is. So like on, in some of the Gospels, like for instance, the Gospel of John, he's trying to show that Jesus is God. That's his main point. You could call it his thesis statement. That is what he is focusing on. Well, the other three Gospels don't try so hard. Luke has a strong, stronger emphasis on the Holy Spirit than any of the other Gospels. So was the Holy Spirit not involved in the other ones? No, it's just that was his one of his main thesis. Um, if you look in Luke, Luke has more of a slant towards people who were um, kind of overlooked in society, the poor people, women, that kind of stuff. Um, not that the other ones don't, it's just that he has more of an emphasis. So the events were reported, not created. And this is, this is very important because all the Gospels give the same essence just slightly different. Word, word is slightly different. And the, another interesting thing is that they follow not just journal standards of the day, they also follow how journalists write today, too. But people, for whatever reason, when they go to the gospel, they expect some, uh, some kind of a different standard than they themselves hold to. And it's like, that, what? <laughs> so basically, you're going to find something wrong with the Bible, and you're going to create a contradiction, even if there isn't one, because you just have it set in your mind to do it. Which is funny, because whenever I get in arguments with people about the Bible not having contradictions, they always throw that at me. Well, you're just trying to justify every little thing away. You have an answer for everything. It's like, yeah, because there is an answer for everything. <laughs> like, anyways, um, so in Mark and Luke, they have parts of the whole that Math Matthew included the entire quotation. But Okay, uh, next verse we'll look at here is verse 18, and it says, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. So this is an interesting verse because the Roman Catholic Church kind of uses it to teach the whole thing about the popes. You know, them having supreme power and all this different stuff. So uh, Peter, the name means rock, and Peter definitely was a rock to the church. Um, he was a pillar of the church, much like a lot of the apostles were. Um, and he uh, was foundational to the church as it spread among Jews, the same way as Paul was foundational to the, to the church as it spread among the uh, Gentiles. But he wasn't the rock. Okay, Jesus was the rock, the cornerstone. Okay, he's not teaching. This is not teaching papal authority, the popes having authority. There's a few things that we can know that for a fact. First off, Peter was married. Popes are not allowed to be married. Peter was fallible. Popes are, are supposed to be infallible. What they say is absolutely true, right? Well, we have many situations of Paul saying something that was wrong. For instance, uh, in Galatians, Paul mentions how he, how he corrected Paul because he was wrong with – I mean Peter – because he was wrong with what he was doing. We have it in the Gospels, Jesus correcting, you know, hey, get behind me, Satan. Um <clears throat> So Jesus is the foundation of the church, not not Peter. Peter, like the other apostles, was the foundation of the church, especially among the Jews. And one of the leaders, he was a foundation, but he wasn't the foundation, if you get what I'm saying. So when it says here in uh, verse 18, I say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Some people try and, try and weasel out of the whole Peter thing by saying something along the lines of this. Well, he's actually talking about... He's talking to Peter, but then he switches, and he's talking about something else. So um, basically, and I will say to you that you are Peter, and now I'm talking about something else. And upon this rock, this rock being uh, uh, my my church. It's like, wait, what? What? <laughs> a lot of people try to weasel out of it. It doesn't seem that like that's that like that's even possible. 
it's very obvious he's talking about how Peter is going to be a, a, a foundational player in the church's early days. Um, so, uh, that takes us to verse 20, which says, Then he gave the disciples strict orders that they were to tell no one that he was the Christ. Why no one? Why didn't Jesus want people to know? Well, there's actually different reasons according to where, in which passage he's saying it. Um, so some of the examples, sometimes he wanted them to wait till after the resurrection. So on some of them he says, don't tell anyone until afterwards. If, if this Is this one of the ones where he says it? No, this isn't one of the ones. But on some of the some of the passages, it says strict orders to tell no one until the time until the time of his kingdom, or until you know he it says it something like that. So that's one reason. Sometimes he was trying to limit the crowds. There are sometimes when Jesus um, was being swarmed by people and he didn't really want that, so he would tell people not to say anything. Um, sometimes he didn't want demons to give a recommendation, so he'd be like, um, you know. Casting out a demon, you know, a demon from a possessed man, and he would say, the demon was his, and like, you are the Christ. He'd be like, be quiet. <laughs> he didn't want, you know, hey, yeah, I'm having de demons testify about me. Great, <laughs> great uh, review there. Uh, like Satan, you know, reviewing a Bible. This is the best Bible I've read. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, I, mean, I, I'm suddenly a little bit hesitant about reading this Bible. <laughs> um, Um, sometimes he wanted to avoid the assumptions of the Christ. So people had kind of their mind made up about what the Christ entailed. Um, John even records a story about some people trying to come to him and force him to be the king right then and there. Because, hey, you're the Christ, so you had to be the king right now. And so they tried to take him by force to make him king. And uh, this is just one of the examples of the different expectations that people had of the Christ that wasn't really what Jesus wanted. So he would say, hey, no, uh, let's just kind of be quiet about this. And so, depending on the case, we have at least there like what four or five uh, examples of, of why he would say that, depending on where it was found. Um, so then, in verse twenty-eight, truly I say to you, you, I mean, sorry, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming into His kingdom. Now, this sounds like what he's saying is, you who are following me right now will not die until I return at at the end of the age. Okay. It sounds like that, and so then the obvious problem is, but he didn't. Well, <laughs> it's not as complicated as we make it out to be. First off, it's probably a reference to the transfiguration. If you look in your Bible, the very next verse, okay, so we'll read the verse we just read. Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming into his kingdom, chapter 17, verse 1. Six, day later, six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led, led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun. Do you think that could possibly be what he's talking about? That just makes sense. If you read the passage, it's like, oh, he's talking about their transfiguration. Now, what are this? Some of you who are standing here will not taste death until this happens. Some of the ones literally who were there with him in the previous passage are up here on the mountain with him. Peter and John for two. I mean, I kind of feel like this is something that isn't as complicated as it people make it out to be. So it's probably a reference to the transfiguration, which happens right after. And uh, it could also, there's a, there's a slight chance it could be a reference to the coming of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. After Jesus resurrected and the church is all gathered in one place, the Holy Spirit de descends. It could potentially be a reference to that. I, I don't know, because he seems to be talking specifically about the Son of Man, not the, not the Holy Spirit. Look at this. He will not taste death until he see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So that doesn't that seems to exclude the Holy Spirit. It could also have multiple fulfillment, fulfillments in a way that, okay, yes, it's going to start happening now, but it won't be completed until then. They did definitely – there were, are definitely times in the Bible when prophecies said like that, oh, this is going to happen. Well, it started to happen. See what I mean? So technically, yes, they saw him come into his kingdom when he ascended. But it didn't reach its full conclusion with him coming back. So you could say that too. Um, it, I don't really believe that. I believe it's a reference to the transfiguration. It seems most likely to me. Um, let's see what else. It could also be a reference uh, to maybe John's vision in the book of Revelation. I very highly doubt that. Um, it could also be a reference to the kingdom coming. You know, um, Peter, for, I mean, Jesus, for instance, says to one of the Pharisees, the kingdom is among you. It's right here, right now. He's talking about himself. And so he could technically be saying 
uh, the Son of Man coming in his kingdom as the start of the church, which would reach its climax with him coming back physically. It could be any of those things. I personally, once again, I really think he's talking about the transfiguration. And if you read it, read the end of chapter 16 and then read 17, it seems very clear to me. But, okay. So that takes us all the way to Matthew 19. There's nothing major in 17, 18, 17 or 18. So, uh, Okay, so in 19, uh, there's this kind of a series of things that he talks about. And I'll start off with it. Excuse me. But we're just going to kind of stop because I don't want to read the whole thing and take up all that time. And someone came to him and said, Teacher, what good thing shall I do so that I may obtain eternal life? And some of the other Gospels say, Good teacher, what thing must I do? Okay. Um, and he said, to, he said to him, Why are you asking me about what is good? There is only one who is good. But if you want to enter life, keep the commandments. So this makes it sound like he's denying being good. And I've, I've preached on this. I've, I've taught on this many times. But so this is just going to be more of a more of a lighter look, I guess. First off, he never said that he wasn't good. He just said, "Why are you calling me that?" that? Um, the question was more, "What is your purpose for calling me good?" Or, or in the case of Matthew, for asking what good thing. It was a way of addressing his heart, the way that he, the way that he was absorbed with, you know, I'm a good person. He basically was confronting his self righteousness. Um, but other parts in the Gospels do definitely clarify uh, that Jesus is God and that he is good. So we shouldn't take this one verse out of context to say, hey, uh, Jesus is denying his deity. That's just stupid. Uh, so, okay, going on to the next point. Um, when we read this, it says, you know, what good thing? And then Jesus goes to this great lengths to say, hey, um, it, nothing, no one is good but 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 God. And then he says, you know, follow the commandments and everything. So then we get this 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 thing. No one is good except for God. Okay, but then we go back, if you guys remember when we were looking at chapter 3 and chapter 12, um, verse uh, 35, it says this. The good person brings out of his good treasure good things, and the evil person brings out of his evil treasures evil things. So it sounds like Jesus is kind of talking out of both sides of his mouth. Like how can how can you say no one is good, and then say, like, at the same time, the good person brings good. Like, how, how is this possible? Well, the, the problem here is with context. In the passage in chapter 12 where he says the good person brings from his good, uh, he's more talking about goodness as righteousness, someone who is living upright or um, living in obedience to God. Um, not good as in their character, their essence. But in chapter chapter uh, 19, he's talking about how no one is in their character and their in their in their being good. There is righteousness that comes from faith, but no one has righteousness that emanates from themselves. Okay, so God is completely righteous. He doesn't have to have somebody standing up for him. He is. That's what he is. He cannot vary from that. Um, I don't remember if it's in this lesson or not, but we're going to look at um, somewhere along the lines of, you know, can God do – are all things possible with God? Well, so then God can be evil. No, no, that's stupid. God cannot vary from his character of perfection, okay? Whereas we are not perfect and we do vary. Jesus is our intercessor. He stands for us in our unrighteousness, and our righteousness – is his righteousness. So I saw a, a picture that I think really sums it up. There's this guy in rags, and he says, God help me. And Jesus comes up wearing this white garment, and he sets the cross down, and he switches clothes with him, and then he walks on with carrying the cross. That would be a good example of what, what's happening here. Um, the person with rags has Jesus' garment, if you will, put over them. It's not their own righteousness. It doesn't emanate from them. So a good person would be someone who, according to Proverbs and the law, is obeying God, who's living in submission to God. Not that they are good in their character in and of themselves emanating goodness, but that they trust in God. So talking about two different things. No one is good in nature except for God, but there are those who are good or wise or righteous through faith in Jesus as compared to those who are evil or rebellious to God or foolish. The Proverbs uses those terms kind of switch in. Switching, um, evil, uh, foolish, uh, sluggard, lazy. It kind of combines them all into one person. 
So what is in the heart comes out is what Jesus is talking about in chapter 12. And if God makes the tree good, the fruit will be also. So if God does a work in your heart, something will come out from that. If you hear somebody claiming to be Christian, but they just talk, tra talk trash all the time, gossip, complain, they're just nasty, na nasty people, chances are Jesus never did something in their heart. So you, it brings up the question whether they actually are Christians. Christians don't go around gossiping and backbiting. That's not something that they do. From the good comes out good. So if Jesus has made the tree good, <laughs> the fruit will be good also. That's what he's talking about. And he's talking about the way that um, that what is inside eventually makes its way out. People can fool you for a good part of the time, but you can't fool everybody all the time. It's just not possible. So, um, and also this is another thing mentioning, uh, kind of foreshadowing something in the Bible. It's all throughout the Bible. It's called the already but not yet principle. So something began its fulfillment, and it's kind of is, but has, doesn't reach its full conclusion. Are a good example of that? Are we saved? Yes. So we're in heaven. No. So we can still abandon God, right? Well, yes. But I thought you said our our salvation was assured. It's the exact same thing. Already, but not yet. We are saved, but we're still being saved, and we wait the day of salvation. See what I mean? It's already, but not yet. Okay. Um, okay, so then that takes us to verse 21, unless there's questions. More of a comment. Go ahead. Uh, comment away. With what you had just said, like, already but not yet, I explained it to, I ended up explaining it to somebody like this. It's like putting your name on a reservation mm -hmm. list. You can always take your name off the reservation list, but as long as your name's on the reservation list, you have a reservation. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a that's like that. that's a good example. Good, yeah, that's a good example. That's perfect. Yeah. Okay. So verse twenty one, Jesus said to him, "If you want to be complete, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor." And this is him talking to the same guy. Okay. And you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. We have to give up all of our all of our belongings. Now hold on, hold on, hold on. Don't miss the forest for the trees here, guys. First off, he didn't give a command to everyone, but to the one. That's important. He didn't say, everyone in the world do this. In fact, he only tell, tells it to one person in all the Gospels. Next off, he told the person what their biggest thing that was keeping them from really being happy and fulfilled in Christ. Their stuff. They were just too satisfied with what they had. Too assured of their, of their own goodness. So that brings us to another point. Riches shouldn't own us. We should owe them. I'm sorry, own them. We should be able to use them without feeling like we have we can't part from them. It's like when it gets to be the ring from the Lord of the Rings. My precious. Probably a bad thing. You know, but if it's like, eh, whatever. Like there's this character in the Lord of the Rings, the book. that He didn't make it into the movies. His name is Tom Bombadil. And he gets the ring. And he's just like flippant with it. He's like, ah, oh, whatever. And Frodo's like, oh, it's such a precious thing. And Tom's like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> like it, it has no effect on it because it, it, you that's kind of what I'm talking about. Um, it, money for some of us is nothing more than an opportunity to help others and to bring about God's kingdom. But for other people, money is like the thriving pursuit of all life. And they're never happy. And they're always wondering why. And so they keep searching and searching, but they never find. So dis and the disciples gave if they wanted it was not a command. If you read in Acts, for instance, it says that the early church, they were selling off their position. It didn't say that they were commanded to. It also doesn't say that everybody was doing it. It just says that they were doing it. So, uh, another thing, God provides and what we do with what is provided is good or evil. The, Bi the Bible says that God makes the rich and the poor man. That means no matter how hard you try, if God has set in his heart to oppose what you're doing, you will not succeed it. You know what I mean? But with that being said, that doesn't mean that every time that God allow, allows somebody to get riches, he's, he's blessing them. That's, that's not necessarily what I'm saying. But rather, God is in control, and he can bring about what he has planned. If he wants to make a rich person poor, he'll do it. But either way, God has allowed the rich person to be rich, and he has allowed the poor person to be poor. And I think that it would be very foolish to look at the things that we say and I've got, I say, I've gotten here all by myself. Or, I can do whatever I want with it. 
God provides, and what we do with it is what is with what is provided is what is either good or, or evil. So let's say, for instance, God has given us all time. How are we going to spend that time for ourselves, for others? It's what we do with what's given us that makes it good or evil. It's the same thing. It's like owning a gun. If you put a gun on that table, well, it's not going to really serve any purpose. If you put it in your hands, it could potentially serve a purpose. It's the same kind of an idea. So I guess a good way of, of kind of wrapping up, on, including some other things from other parts of the Bible, enjoy what you have. You know, it, it, it's not like you should be afraid of having money or having things. Um, it, 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 it's, it's good to enjoy what you have. Provide for others. Hey, that's good. Love it and mistreat others to keep it. Well, that's bad. When, pe when things start taking the place of people, that's, that's bad. When you use um, your opportunity with people to get more of the thing, that's bad. Um, so in verse 26 it says this it is not I'm sorry I'm in chapter 20 there we go chapter 19 verse 26 and looking at them Jesus said to them with people this is impossible with God all things are possible okay so I did include this on this and, but with God all things are possible and then you get to Hebrews 6.18 and it says so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. Why? He said all things were possible for God. And you're, now you're telling me that he can't lie? Well, what good is it if he can't even lie? Well, I understand what the point is being made, but it, in my opinion, it sounds very, very foolish. So let me just do a real quick breakdown. I've talked about this in other philosophical lessons. I don't really want to get too much into philosophy tonight, but let's just kind of unwrap this in an easy way. There's a difference between God's character and his actions. He cannot be evil, but he can do what no one else can. Okay, does that kind of make sense? So, can God work in this situation that you're in right now? Yes, he can do what is impossible for other people. That's his actions. Can God cease to be God? Can he change who he is? No, that's his character. We're talking about two different things, who he is and what he can do. He can do, he cannot be something other than what he is. That is, so he can't, he's not all-powerful. That, that's not what it means to be all-powerful. It's not... Being able to do limitless things, even things that are contradictory, like that's just stupid. It's impossible for humans, but not for God. God cannot cease to be God. To say that God is limited or unable because he can't cease to be God is it's just a logical fallacy. You could have an entire philosophical discussion about how stupid this argument is. Let me see if I can summarize all that philosophy into something that maybe wouldn't be so complicated to get. If God I, – I don't know if I can summarize this in, a, in an easier way. You could literally write a book explaining this point, but basically it's a faulty assumption. The assumption says that God ceases to be God if he can't do everything I can imagine versus everything according to his character. It's a faulty thing. That's like saying Nicole isn't really a woman unless she can grow a penis. What? That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. It's it's that same kind of it's you're you're making an equivalent where there isn't one. You know? Oh, so God isn't can't do the impossible unless he can do this thing as well. The you you're you're equating two different things that don't go together as being together. God can't have made the apple tree unless it can produce an orange. Like what? Th those are two different things. You you that's not a fair standard. Like That's not a logical conclusion. That's a, a blurring of the lines to get the conclusion that you want. Now, once again, I, that could have been worded a lot better if we would have spent like three weeks in a philosophical discussion, but I don't think anybody really wants that. I know I kind of don't really want that. It kind of hurts my brain when I go and talk too much about philosophy. But anyways, Matthew 20, and we will stop in Matthew 20. So verse 1, for the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. And it says that he went at different times of the day and hired people and that he gave them all the same amount. So like for instance in verse 2, when he agreed with the laborers for denarius for the day, he sent them. And then later he finds other ones agreed for denarius for, the, for what was left of the day and then he sent them. And then he goes again, denarius for the rest of the day. So three different times at three different parts of the day. And so the, at the end of the story, all of the laborers get the same pay, even the ones that started later in the day. 
they get the same pay as the one who started in the, in the beginning of the day. So the question becomes, are all rewards the same or no? Because then there's other verses where Jesus says that you will be given according – that Jesus will give according to what somebody has earned. Like in Revelation, he will give according to what, what, what was done. Or in a lot of the other parables around Matthew, that he will give according to what somebody did. But this verse makes it sound like, just kidding, everybody gets equal pay even when they didn't do anything. It's like, well, hold on. First off, when we get saved, we all get the same pay, salvation. Okay, so there's that. Second, God gives grace that we don't deserve. He gives it to everyone. Even people who never repent, he gives a measure of grace to. Doesn't it say that the rain falls on the righteous and the wicked? Just because their ultimate end is punishment doesn't mean that he didn't give show any grace while they were alive. That's completely faulty. So God gives grace that we don't deserve. We don't all do the same, and we don't all do the same things, right? Like, so for instance, I've worked in an orphanage. By show of hands, who else has worked in an orphanage? There's two people out of four that have worked in an orphanage, okay? You guys haven't. Well, did you get the same pay? Yes. You got saved just like I got saved. You got grace given to you that you didn't deserve just like I got grace given to you that I didn't deserve. Not everybody does the same things, and we don't all have the same opportunities we don't all have the same opportunities. There are people who are saved right now in Ukraine that do not have the opportunity to go work at an orphanage. They got other things going on right now. <laughs> not everybody has the same opportunity. okay? And not everybody has the same capacity. Isaiah, for instance, is handicapped. He will never be able to do the things physically that other people can do. doesn't mean he'd, he's useless or pointless. That's not what I'm talking about at all. We all have our own limits, is what I'm saying. We don't have, we don't all have the same opportunity or capacity to do the same, but we all receive grace, undeserved, from God. So, that's that. So now that we've said that, third, we receive some rewards in this life and the next based off our actions, words, and attitudes. So I've talked about how we get saved and we get grace. We all get the same pay. But now to combine everything, yes, yes, the rewards differ. When we all get to heaven, we will not get the same rewards. Some people will get more. Some people will get less. How? According to what they did. That's one thing the Bible says very clearly. Number two, according to what was said. The Bible says that every we will have to give an answer for every word that we spoke. So, with that being said, <laughs> I think that there's a difference there. Uh, third off, um, our attitudes that we showed for different, t different things. And, see, I already said words, didn't I? attitudes um, and the things that we did okay yeah so based on those two things yes we will receive different rewards the bible is very clear about that um it talks about this also in greater length in revelation and matthew and somewhere else but anyways okay uh next thing any questions on that no? okay and uh, next thing verse 20 says, Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus with her sons, bowing down and making a request of him. And he said to her, What do you desire? She said to him, Say that, say that in your kingdom these two sons of mine shall sit, one at your right hand and one at your left. So in the other Gospels, Mark, I'm sorry, in Mark 10, 34, it says that the mother came, but it says that, it says that this, the two sons of Zebedee were the ones who asked the question. So the question being, well, who, who came first? Who said something? Well, actually... Both, probably. Have you ever had your mom rush up and say something real quick and you try to say something and you say something too? So you kind of sneak it in there too? It probably happened fast like that. But even if it didn't, it still probably it was her speaking on their behalf, so it could be like they were speaking. Let's say, for instance, you're my mom and I'm talking to you. Hey, mom, I want to sit at his right hand when, he, when in his kingdom. I'll help you, son. Okay, so you're going on my behalf. We talked about something. Now you're going on my behalf. So it's like I'm talking. We already talked about this with the centurion sending people in his stead. So maybe the mother spoke first. It was a big request. What are the chances they sat there quietly while their mom spoke? I mean, it could have happened. I don't find it very likely. Uh, she was speaking on their behalf as well, so it was like they were speaking either way. So that one's pretty easy. We'll go ahead and move on to 29 through 34. And I probably won't read this whole thing. As they were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. 
And two people who were blind sitting by the road, hearing that Jesus was passing by, cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. So this story repeats, and it's slightly different as to whether he was going into Jericho or out of Jericho when the event happened. Now, this could potentially actually be a contradiction, because if he's going in and going out, it's not possible. He's either going here or he's going there. Well, first off, it never says in any of the Gospels that only one, there was one and only one person being healed. So in the other in the other Gospels where it says, instead of right here where Matthew says there were two, um, in the other ones where it says, and there was a blind man, it doesn't mean that there was one and only one. We already looked at this. Where there's, where there's, where there's three, there's one, right? That's a, ma a mathematical fact. Okay. So... The first thing to say is that it never says in any of the Gospels that there's only one blind person. In Mark's account, in 1046, it seems as though he... Hold on. Mark 1046. I'll just go there. Then they came to Jericho, and later as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples in a large crowd, a beggar who was blind named Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the road. Listen to the things that are different here. First off, this one only mentions one blind person, but we already said that that doesn't really matter. Where there's, where there's two, there is one. So, it never says that there is one and only one in Mark. Okay. Next off, it sounds like Mark specifically knows this man, doesn't it? Listen to how specific he gets. He as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples in a large crowd, a beggar who was blind named Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the road. It sounds like he really knows this guy. So if he knew that guy and he didn't know the other guy, it's reasonable to assume that he might have mentioned the one person that he knew. If you're going and you see people driving up to a concert, there's a Def Leppard concert, and you see them going off to Def Leppard. The car is full of people. But the only person in the car is, that you know is Eli. So you say Eli was driving up to a Def Leppard concert. You liar. Well, no, that's the person I knew. I didn't say that he was alone. It's like walking into a forest and saying there was eight trees. Right. Well, there's a bunch of trees, but there's at least eight trees. Right, and so you weren't wrong. <laughs> Mathematically. <laughs> Anyways, but there's a few different things also. Um, so we can break this up into two different things. First off... Was it was there two blind people or only one? Well, it looks like there were two, but some of the Gospels don't mention the other one. Okay, so now we get to the other question that we can ask. Were they coming or going to Jericho? Because as that passage I just read in Mark 10.46 says that they were leaving Jericho. The one in Matthew says they are going to Jericho. Okay, well, let's really quick wrap this up because it's not going to be that complicated. First off, there were possibly two different blind, blind people healed, like um, two different times when blind people were being killed. Where would blind people have been? Beggars? Well, they would have been at the outskirts of the, by that by that gate there. That's where they would have been. So it's very it's very possible. Now that would require them both yelling the same thing. Son of David, have mercy on me. You know, okay, yeah, but I mean, what are the chances that that was the only person who ever yelled that? Or is it possible that the one blind dude, uh, hearing because he couldn't have seen, hearing that the other people were healed when they said that, thought. That's what I need to say to get healed. <laughs> yeah. It's possible, right? Um, so one was coming, uh, and if you if you read it, in one of it, it says that there was a multitude with him when he was coming into Jericho, and then the other gospel says that there was a great multitude when he was leaving. So um, it's possible that it's talking about two different events. There's nothing actually to make us assume that this is the exact same event. Um, possibly there is a mistake in our com in our copies, you know, um, throughout the time. Maybe they simply forgot whether he was coming to the city or leaving the city. Or maybe when they were, like I say, when they were making copies of this, they simply mixed something up, and we are now left with one gospel saying that he was going out and one gospel saying that he was going in. However, I do want to point out that if that is the case, remember that the essence of the story stays the same. Blind person healed by Jesus outside of Jericho. Nothing has changed with the essence of that. And that's what I was talking about. 
so in our eyes, that would be, oh, that would be a mistake. Well, in their eyes, not necessarily so much. More like, okay, it was outside of Jericho. What does it matter whether he's going in or going out? Well, it matters a good deal to me. Why does it matter to you? Well, I don't know, but it seems like that's something I should care about. See what I mean? A lot of the times that we get worked up about something, it doesn't really matter that much. Um, <clears throat> there is another possibility that I wanted to mention to you guys. Um, there are technically two different Jerichos. One was the original city, then it was rebuilt slightly away from the other ones. So you could technically say it's possible that these are two different Jerichos. The problem with that, it seems very unlikely. It seems like he went into the city and then came out. It, it, it doesn't seem very likely. Um, it's also possible that the initial encounter happened outside. Then he followed Jesus, and then Jesus finally answered as he left Jericho. Okay, so Jesus is walking into Jericho. The person start, the blind dude start, starts engaging Jesus. They go into Jericho, do their thing, and the blind dude just like following them around, I guess, like <laughs> stubbing his toes, I guess. And then they leave, and so it was actually reached. The story reaches a con its conclusion when he's leaving. I find that very far fetched. That doesn't. That seems like you're just trying to too hard to make the story bend, and I don't know. That just doesn't make sense. I, I actually lean more towards the the answer that um, it, they got confused as to whether he was leaving or coming more so than that one. I don't think that that's what happened. I don't think they got confused. I think it's talking about two different stories. A grand total of three blind people being healed. That's my take on it. I could be wrong. That, that just seems most likely to me. Whatever. Um, if only he would have recorded the names of the other two. But the problem with that idea is that if uh, Jesus went in, the people followed him, he went and he came out and then healed them outside, it would require that he turned right back around and went back in again. If you read this story, you'll see what I'm talking about. It just, there's just, that, that, that doesn't make sense at all. Um, were you about to say something, uh, Nicole? Okay. Okay, so the last thing to say here, some difficulties in the Bible are difficult to figure out and have multiple possible answers. And your job is pretty much just to figure out which one is the most likely. It's hard, but it's kind of like when you're on a jury. You can't absolutely know what happened for fact most of the time. Unless you were there. Unless you were there. So you go on what seems to be most likely. Or... Um, if you want to be actually legal, it would be um, whether the prosecution gave sufficient evidence beyond reasonable reasonable no. doubt. I don't really hold to that. I think it's nonsense, but that's why I wasn't allowed to be a juror. <laughs> juror. <laughs> I guess, whatever. Um, okay, so rushing to a contradiction is too definite with limited data. You, you really need to be careful about, oh, it's just wrong. I mean, there, there are other steps that you could possibly consider. Either way, nothing has been lost, and it was outside Jericho that it happened. We don't have an itinerary of everywhere Jesus was, so it seems kind of maybe let's not get ahead of ourselves. Some blind people were held outside, outside of Jericho. Like, it doesn't have to be overly complicated. So, any questions?